Да, тянима Люксенда, а то он жили кито, то он Люксендус. So at the outset of the empowerment, according to the tradition, an offering will be made to those that will cause obstacles to the giving and receiving of the empowerment. Да, а то кит лаяти, чило лаяо маре, тянима а то та танжоши милюрун бочи, топ, а не а, а не лама санжи хунго чава дочи чам. ジノウテンラジンジ。何ちゅうティパチェンボ。あね、さんがとじてば。デンダイギ。何コカプサチェンボ。よて。ちゅうデンダイよてけばさんぼ。デラ。デニンがそ。お、た。テリンオンティジュ
the Buddha, historical Buddha, our teacher, the source of uh, the practices that we do. He appeared in the world uh, more than 2,500 years ago. And at that time, I gave many uh, vast and also many profound uh, instructions. And these were not given randomly, but rather in accordance to the dispositions, fortunes, and inclinations of uh, sentient beings. And based thereupon, we can talk of receiving the transmission or teaching in and of itself, and also through practice, the realization thereof. Accordingly, then, the, te Buddha, the teaching of Buddha can be divided into that of transmission and uh, realization, something most precious. Sanjung When we think of spiritual teachers that have come into our world, into our world system, if you will, and the teachings uh, they've given, what makes uh, our teacher, Buddha, uh, special in a way is that principally he taught interdependence, or rather he observed interdependence and then revealed that which he'd perceived in such a way that he taught us how to become our own kind of refuge, how to protect ourselves from the experiences of dissatisfaction that we all have. So it's imperative to reflect upon the teacher through his, or through its, if you will, uh, teaching, and thereby generate a sense of what we usually translate as faith or devotion or trust or an, and openness uh, to his instruction. So accordingly, we would say that Trust and openness to the teaching of the Buddha comes through then initially looking at the teaching in and of itself and then analyzing it and realizing the truth of it for oneself. Also, mm. Mm. Then Temba ji sung nang doa, ani gog pe temba, ani lam ji temba sung du, ani thar tu gog pe temba se du, ani ngaran su dungi mandu ba de loru ba yin de ba ji dang, ani semi rang yin ge loru ba yu cha ju yi dungi pe te ya ze dang, semi ji rang yin gog pe temba, ani thak ba, ani ji kan zu du ba nye ba ji ba ji gog pe temba zon ji ngo zu. Then and to do When we think of ourselves, and indeed when we look around us at others, we have something in common, and this is a kind of feeling of dissatisfaction. 
that something is not quite right. Accordingly, the Buddha introduced this as simply the way of things, what is often translated as suffering, but let us use the Pali expression term or the Buddhist hybrid term, dukkha. Dukkha means a lack of enduring satisfaction. And it is that that is uh, the flavor, if you like, of our predicament, what we may call samsaric existence. And it is this that the Buddha introduced to us. He revealed why we are feeling discomfort, discomforted, where this feeling of discomfort comes from, was introduced as the origin of dukkha itself, action, action that is formed through and engaging of a disturbing emotion with its origin and this fundamental distortion of reality. Thereupon, the nature of that kind of reality uh, was revealed as not something kind of truly or inherently existent, but rather as something which is mutually dependent. As it is mutually dependent or interdependent, it lacks independence or existence from its own side, if you will. So if we are familiar with this, we can bring about a cessation of the origin of dukkha, the experience of dukkha, and thereby we can actualize what is known as the cessation or the stopping of that dukkha experience. Now when we think of the cessation or stopping of dukkha, there is that which experiences the stopping. And this is the, the nature of awareness or nature of mind itself. Nature of mind in the aspect of the ultimate cessation, the stopping then of this experience of dukkha, which is often then understood to be the kind of final experience of what we may call um, luminosity in the aspect of great bliss. So in order to get to this point, one needs to engage uh, mutual dependence or interdependence. And in order to do that, then the Buddha taught many methods, many means, many instructions, if you will. These can be put together as what is generally uh, surmised as the path, the instructions in leading uh, to the cessation. So accordingly, we can reflect upon cause and effect, the origin of dukkha leading thereto, and the path leading to then the experience of the cessation of said dukkha. And accordingly, we can, we, we can reflect upon the nature of appearances, and their nature. Accordingly, we talk and talk of the relative and ultimate truth, or truth as a convention, and truth as a, the ultimate expression of something. So when we talk of the way things appear to us, and the way we kind of hanker or grasp after them, this is the all-obscuring truth that is relative. And we can similarly talk about its nature, its essential nature, which is completely free of any tangibility or inherent uh, uh, being. This is then the ultimate uh, truth. And within uh, reality, if you like, as revealed uh, by the awakened one, or Buddha, what we would say is that there is nothing that isn't included within truth as convention and truth in its ultimate expression. That's all. Mm. Nani, Dangzi Mariba Yimba Dang, and in Dee, a cartoon of Numo Yonsu Tobadi, and Maripi Loyim. Maripa, Lodoedi, Zimba de Indel, Lo Chingi Lo Deva, and in Chingi Lo Mate, and a low turne, low nunget, Zimba nunget the drone, and was a corva chumji. D. Mevazoe, tap, tap, chimba, and in Shirap, she chingi, and Chungo de Sung, Tombani, Ten Sung in the Nala, then in Tombani, Tara Mamboji. Nitsu 
ले मां बोसा अने तंगजी मरी पाए जेवांगे अने ए दुंगे वाला देवान जिंबा मेता पाला तकवान जिंबा मिजा वेरांजी चंगमान जिंबा दे थमजे ला ता मे वाला ताक तो जीने लोंगे देरे जिये अने चिंग देवान दे अने दे सेमजे थमजे खमदा मेबे निचुंगाने नंगबे सुसु नंगसी के नंगबाई ना जिने छिड़ावा दोते बा सेमजावा ओमाओ बा ओमा रंगजे बा तंजुर बा सेलाम ने थर्दु अने तावा चिंजी मारु बा पिदु चुंगादे रिंबे कले 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 नातुगी गाक्षा ठारा मुंजीन चिन अने चमु सेम शिंदु अने थकवा तो को मरे दा चुनम थमजे रंगजी जे तंबर जुबा दर जम मैं भाई की यानी कुंभा ची ची बादे शे ची ना ना सुन ना दो दे ना ये ये चंचू की सेम आह ता चौ थाम जी तंबर जो बात तर्जा में भी नहीं सुनेंगे ना ते ने रंग चिंचिं दे अने खरी जुगर होगा ता गो कुने तो क्या ही बा तंगजी ना आ मरी बादी नहीं सुनेंगे ना गो कुने अने मुंग दे वा दे यं सिम जाचे चुंग इन्हीं से उन्हें नहीं ना अन्य पे तीन जाव कुछ चीज़ बोल मेवा रंग चीज़ को चुरे लो दी इन्हें ना ता मेवा ला ताऊ तो जी उन्हें तो ना ले आ रंग ना इन्हें तो ना चुकतो बाते जी ना तो ना जाचे बोते जी अन्य दी तो ना तंबर जी तेरा जी ना लते नहीं जंबाचा जिंबा लते � मरीब देखे ता दी की नीचे इंगाने रंग चिंजी दे अने ले यूं दे ता देखा मालूम है रंग चिंजी दे गो क्यों ने तो क्या ही बात है जेन चिंजी चंचु की सेम सेम जंबो अने चंबो जाचे वाला ने अने तब के तो की चेंबर जी ना तो बात सुन ना दो आला शेजी ना Uh, many uh, discourses or instructions, teachings, uh, if you will, to deal with uh, the predicament that sentient beings find themselves in, wishing to be free from the experience of what is essentially a lack of uh, satisfaction and to experience uh, happiness with some kind of degree of stability, you might say. Accordingly, we can say that the Buddha gave uh, the causal teachings of the Sutrayana, the resultant teachings of the Madrayana or Vajrayana. Now, when we put the teaching of the Buddha into categories, the first, what is known generally as the first turning of the Dharma wheel, the first category, uh, includes teachings such as those of the Four Noble Truths, which I mentioned uh, just now. The second uh, turning of the Dharma wheel, then, is the particular grouping of teachings or instructions which introduced the the nature of things, the essentially empty nature of things. We can say, for example, when we look at or when we contemplate on the vulnerable truths, mention is made of the truth of cessation, isn't it? So when we reflect then upon the Gokden or the truth of uh, cessation, how do we bring that about? How do we experience it? Well, in a way, we can say we need to rely upon the path. So what is the path? path here, then, is the direct recognition or cognition, realization, if you will, of emptiness. Accordingly, then, it's imperative to reflect upon the experience of dukkha, to understand its origin of action motivated by disturbing emotion or destructive states of mind, if you will, which find their basis or their origin in this fundamental distortion uh, of reality, which we will call uh, confusion, or is sometimes translated as ignorance or dimmed awareness, etc. There is a kind of projection of autonomy onto that which has only ever been interdependent. And then, not only is there a projection, but rather there is a grasping thereupon, a kind of reification, if you like. And this reification then is, in and of itself, because its object is mistaken, it is generally what we would call a wrong consciousness or a confused mind. 
And this confusion then engages with objects in a confused way, and thereby we experience a variety of emotions, each and every one of which projects a sense of autonomy onto its object and then reacts. That action is then karma. Accordingly, then, we have the very origin of du the experience of dukkha, which is none other than the effect of the action engaged under the influence of this emotion, which has its foundation in this fundamental distortion of uh, reality. Accordingly, then, within the second turning of the Dharma wheel, the Buddha taught various means or methods, instructions, so as to begin to kind of chip away at this projection and reification of autonomy. Accordingly, when those teachings are grouped together, as they were, then we can talk of uh, the, the Vaibhashika uh, school, the Great Exposition School, uh, the, the, uh, the followers of Sutra uh, school, the Mind Only school, uh, the Middle Way uh, school, and the Middle Way then has two uh, divisions, Sutandraka and, and uh, Prasangika, for argument's sake. And within the Prasangika Madhyamika school, or what there we find as the ultimate expression, the actual nature of things. So why, you may wonder, are so many teachings that are grouped together in these four or five different ways taught? And the simple answer is that they were given so that the recipients could slowly begin the process of refining their understanding of things. Here then we begin with a gross understanding of the emptiness, and then this progresses in subtlety, such that a person is able to make gradual uh, progression to bring about then their ultimate understanding of the empty nature of things, and thereby, that is to say, uh, with familiarity, one is able to upturn and thoroughly do away with this fundamental distortion of reality. That is to say, we can bring, we can bring reality uh, into, into focus. So here, it is imperative then to reflect upon this nature of this mistaken mind. It is mistaken because it, because it is mistaken with regard to the object upon which it uh, imagines is in front of it, and subsequently reifies, that is to say, grasps upon. Now along with this, we should also pause to reflect upon the, away, the mind that aspires to awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. Here, it is imperative to reflect how, just as one self experiences or feels this lack of contentment or lack of satisfaction, others do similarly. And when we reflect upon their experience, it is similar to ours. We've understood how we perpetuate our own experience of uh, this lack of satisfaction, what we'll call contaminated existence. And we're able to then turn that back to bring about its cessation. But, alas, others are not like us. They are still projecting and hankering after autonomy. Based thereupon, they put themselves forward as some independent entity that has to move towards something that it perceives as able to give it pleasure, move away from something that it perceives will cause it harm, etc. This kind of putting oneself above others, what we'll call self-cherishing, if you will, is that which then drives the adherence to this fundamental distortion of, uh, of reality. So accordingly, when we are kind of turning back this distortion or bringing reality into uh, clarity or a more clear view, uh, if you will, we should also pause to reflect on the plight of, of others because we have a relationship with each and every uh, sentient being and when we reflect thereupon, it is just this attitude of putting oneself forward, of holding oneself as superior to others, as independent from others, that is causing our woe, and it's also causing the difficulties that others are experiencing. Accordingly, as we are progressing towards awakening, we should reinforce that with the attitude of a strong attitude within which we kind of pledge or vow, if you will, to awaken so as to awaken all sentient beings, having seen how they themselves are so pitiful in that they are bringing about their own kind of experience of dissatisfaction or discomfort 
an experience that they were so desperate, they are so desperate to be free of, yet perpetuate continually. So, and we can talk of the third uh, kind of category or grouping of the instruction of the Buddha. And this is uh, one which is labeled as the secret uh, mantra or Gya mantra, if you will. And these were instructions that were given at various uh, extraordinary places uh, throughout the noble land of uh, India. And as the teaching is uh, special, it is said that the Buddha would often teach these instructions, displaying then the supreme enjoyment, uh, kaya or dimension, as other occasions then, oh. the kaya or supreme emanation dimension or body. That's all. Mm. <laughs> When we reflect on the different types of teaching, well, we are all individuals, as we've reflected, who would like to uh, be free of this ultimately dissatisfying experience or to be free of discomfort, free of suffering, if you will. And so each teaching of the Buddha is designed with that very purpose in mind. Accordingly then, we can reflect upon the discourse of the Buddha, the 84,000 bundles or types, if you will, of teaching. And what we generally categorize as the causal vehicle of Sudriyana is used to overcome what we'll call then the gross uh, levels of mind or obvious uh, levels of uh, disturbing uh, disturbing emotion. But that is kind of on the surface, if you like. But when we reflect upon the kind of innermost subtle workings uh, of the mind, then in order to remove that which uh, obscures temporarily this uh, kind of nature, that these kind of subtle obscurations which lead to this uh, experience of uh, or di ultimately dissatisfying experience, we then need to reflect upon the teachings of the uh, resultant vehicle of Vajrayana, for it is they who will uproot and remove this uh, adventitious uh, defilement. Mm. <laughs> Ani 
Wow, man, I was just carrying your love so. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. So, <clears throat> accordingly, then we are individuals who, as I mentioned, when we look within on those moments of kind of contemplation or introspection, if you will. We realize that uh, we are we are not really experiencing any enduring uh, satisfaction, and to greater or lesser extent, this bothers us somewhat. And accordingly, then the Buddha taught myriad methods for overcoming uh, this experience of uh, of dukkha. So we can talk, uh, for example, of the three higher trainings. So it is known that a Buddhist practitioner then will engage the higher training in ethical conduct, of concentration or meditation, and ultimately kind of wisdom. Now the point of these three uh, higher trainings, which are found within the various discourses uh, of the Awakened One, or teaching of Buddha, if you will, <clears throat> the point of uh, all of these is to subdue the unruly uh, mind. In other words, to overcome that which brings uh, to overcome the origin of uh, dissatisfaction or suffering, uh, if you will. So, for example, higher training in, in ethics. This is to do with kind of restraint, in a way. One restrains oneself physically, verbally, and mentally through taking up uh, various vows and um, samayas and so forth. 
And by doing this, one is able to curb the appearance of the disturbing emotion because one kind of holds oneself away from the predicament within which such emotions uh, could arise uh, easily. So this is a way then of subduing the unruly mind in a very kind of crass or in a very kind of gross, if you will, uh, aspect, in a very obvious style or way, uh, if you will. And then if we look at then the second higher training, which is the higher training in uh, concentration, so again, through practicing uh, simple sitting meditation, we're able to pacify the coarse movement of mind. We're able to, in the moment, somewhat relief, really, uh, release our adherence to, or following after, hankering after, if you will, the disturbing uh, emotions. And so when we think about all of these uh, practices, and we can similarly kind of look at a different teachings that were given uh, by uh, the Awakened One, which we may say are uh, found within the uh, relative, all-obscuring kind of truth, or truth as convention, if you like. Therein we find uh, ways of, kind of, of looking at uh, individuals and dealing with them in such a way that uh, we don't, are not affected by their, perhaps, abusive behavior. We can practice patience, etc., we can restrain ourselves from engaging in various uh, activities um, so as to curb our adherence or addiction, if you will, to kind of uh, desirous attachment, for example, or pride, jealousy, what have you, by being uh, ethical and open. Thereafter, we can kind of curb the miserly thought, uh, thoughts of miserliness that accrues through our being by uh, being charitable and so forth. We can perhaps extend teaching of a concentration, taking it from a simple absorption. Perhaps we can meditate on various deities, repeat various mantras, um, meditate on mandalas and so forth. But all of these are still within the realm of the world, if you will. So if you were to ask, what is it then that makes them kind of unique to the teaching of the Buddha? Well, all of these actions ethical conduct, concentration, the various um, actions that come out of a meditative absorption and so forth, patience, charity, and uh, meditation on deities, matters, and so forth that I've mentioned. What would make them uniquely Buddhist is if they are all engaged within the understanding of mutual dependence. If one understands this interdependent uh, nature of things, one is able to kind of go beyond grasping at uh, autonomy or independent uh, existence. If one is able to uh, go beyond that, one is able to perfect whatever action one is doing. So we talk about the six uh, perfect actions, or paramita, if you will. But what this actually means in translation is to go beyond. So whatever it's applied to is meditation, for example, that goes beyond. What does it go beyond? It goes beyond this fundamental distortion, this projection of autonomy and subsequent reification and adherence, grasping thereafter, if you will. If these activities, ethical conduct, meditation, whatever, are then engaged with this understanding, thereby one can go beyond. What is it that goes beyond? What is the experience of having gone beyond, if you will? That is what is often termed as great bliss. What is great bliss here? Great bliss then is a designation for completely going beyond grasping mind and that which it grasps at. So when you have the two in play, it's what we'll call duality. So going beyond the duality, one experiences then what is known as the you know, great, uh, great bliss. Great bliss of going beyond. Going beyond duality through understanding the mutually dependent nature of things. Accordingly then, this is the extraordinary kind of feature of the teaching of the Buddha. Everything is understood within the confines of mutual dependence. For this is simply the nature of things as it was observed by the Buddha. And when the Buddha observed this, he became familiar with it 
and or he awoke to it through familiarity with it, uh, you may say. So awakened then is the way of translating the word Buddha. What is Buddha awakened to? The nature of things. What is the nature of things? Is the simply the mutually dependent or empty way things actually abide. And so it is this understanding of interdependence that will allow us to achieve the state of our awakening. Because we're simply being awake to that nature. So in order to become awake to that nature, one becomes familiar with the nature itself. That is to say, one understands mutual dependence and becomes familiar with it, thereby one, ex one awakens to it, and that is then what is meant by Buddha. Now on the way uh, to becoming a Buddhahood, to, to becoming uh, awakened, yeah. to becoming uh, Buddha, it is imperative uh, that we reflect upon others, because like it or not, we are mutually connected. We are inter interdependent uh, with others. Other sentient beings have a pivotal role, not only in our lives now, but when we reflect upon the fact that we've come from innumerable lives in the past. Within those lives we were born, and accordingly as the past lives are innumerable, sentient beings are innumerable, it is fine to say that at some point or another, each and every sentient being has had the experience of being a parent to us. So we reflect then upon this parental nature, and we reflect upon perhaps using mother or parent of this life, how our parents showed us incredible kindness from giving us and the body that we now inhabit, to nurturing us, bringing us up, and so forth. Reflecting upon that kindness will naturally bring about a wish to repay it. And then how to repay that leads to an understanding of love, compassion, and the way to do that then leads to a special, in, special kind of a thought or intention to awaken. That is the only way to really repay the kindness of sentient beings by awakening, so as to awaken or give each and every one of them the method or means uh, to awaken themselves. Similarly, we can reflect upon, within the same reflection upon <clears throat> others and their relationship uh, to us, well, we can reflect upon equalizing and exchanging oneself with others, recognizing the benefit of doing that, recognizing the demerit of avoiding it, uh, etc. So these particular uh, instructions are possible. Indeed, the possibility of our waking up, of our becoming Buddha, of our becoming Buddha, is possible because nothing exists in and of itself, independently. Everything is mutually dependent, or dependently arisen, if you will. Accordingly, everything, anything can happen. So, it is because of dependent arising that an ordinary sentient being can become a Buddha. It is because of dependent arising that we can, through our reflections, develop the precious mind uh, which aspires to awakening for the benefit of, of all sentient beings. All of this is possible because the kind and compassionate teacher, Buddha, revealed interdependence and also the way of getting close to that, getting familiar with that, realizing that. that. It is this that marks our teacher as different uh, from others. It is the Buddha himself who taught mutual, mutual dependence and no other teacher. So when we look in at other spiritual traditions, we can, there within, see both in secular and, this, and both in the secular world and also in the spiritual world. We can see then methods or means of, kind of calming the mind, of meditation, meditating on kind of uh, deities or colors and shapes and spheres, etc. Meditating on the subtle channels, drops and winds uh, in the body, etc. But all of this is done within an understanding that something exists autonomously, truly, in and of itself. Accordingly, any result that comes is going to be similarly seen, or thought of at least, as being independent. And thereby, one is kind of blocking or distorting the reality that is mutual dependence. And because of this fundamental uh, distortion, then there is not the liberation. That is to say, liberation means leaving the this uh, duality that will mark 
in our awakening or kind of thorough cessation of the experience of dukkha. Mm. Uh, that day in the night, uh, そうさ、ちょっと、ちょっと、え、ジェンベ、ちょっと、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま
So accordingly, when we uh, reflect upon the practice of uh, meditation and uh, we think about where we'd like to, to go with that, generally speaking, we talk of we can talk of meditation that is of the world and there beyond. And with regard to meditation that kind of goes beyond in a way, that is one that is held with wisdom. So we talk about bodhicitta. Bodhicitta then, relative and ultimate aspects. We can say then that uh, if we would like to achieve then the state of liberation and, or, or put it another way, uh, so temporary liberation or kind of ultimate uh, liberation, the state of omniscience, that which knows all, if you like, if we're able to kind of do all of our activities, meditation and otherwise, held by this particular attitude, then whatever we engage, whatever practice uh, we do, will bring us closer to the state of liberation and uh, omniscience. For the very reason that when we're engaging those actions, we are looking at their nature. We're acting in accordance with the nature of things. So we talk of precious human life. And if we would like to really give meaning uh, to our life, it is imperative then that we are familiar with uh, this attitude. It is familiar then that we are uh, familiar with the attitude of uh, bodhicitta. And then whatever we do, when we, under, when we reflect upon 
uh, this activity that we're engaging, if we understand its mutually dependent nature, thereby any kind of uh, what we might call grasping or attachment, similarly any kind of uh, dislike or aversion and the hostility that may kind of come about on top of that, any type of uh, destructive uh, attitude or emotion can be exhausted through the familiarity with this mutually uh, dependent uh, nature. And so accordingly then, when we reflect upon life, experience, etc., particularly when we put this in the, the big picture, so to speak, within which we reflect upon this life as one uh, within many, then it is a failure to recognize this mutually dependent nature that holds us within this and the confines of contaminated, contaminated existence. So this being held there is because of the, this uh, fundamental distortion of reality. This is this contaminant. Now if we want to look, clarify reality, to remove the distortion, uh, so to speak, the only thing that can do that is wisdom. And accordingly then, the understanding of mutual dependence, or wisdom if you like, is imperative to the Buddhist practitioner. If we would like to achieve the state of liberation and omniscience, it is only through understanding uh, mutual dependence that we're able to, to do that. Indeed, it is only through this understanding that we are able to exhaust this fundamental distortion of reality, to bring it out of a distorted view into a kind of a clear view, uh, if you will. And so this is the way we, we need to reflect uh, upon ourselves, our lives. When we, for example, think of ourselves, usually we think of the body. When we think of our, that which we possess, uh, our possessions, uh, and so forth, we try to kid ourselves that these things exist uh, in and of themselves, independent, and our reaction with them brings us a kind of independent or truly existent pleasure or discomfort or whatever. So this kind of confusion is kind of made by ourselves, projected by ourselves, reified by ourselves, you know, grasped upon and acted uh, there, uh, there under the influence of by uh, ourselves. And accordingly then, when we recognize this, we recognize that we are... Um, you know, we are uh, kind of bringing about our own kind of experience of dukkha. We are bringing about, we are perpetuating our samsara. We are perpetuating uh, the contaminant which uh, contaminates uh, our experience and brings about all that we would like to be free of. It is imperative then to reflect upon that which brings this about and its opposite. So its opposite then, as I mentioned, is wisdom. Wisdom is then understanding of mutual dependence or interdependence. And this is not another projection. It is rather the stopping of projection and simply looking at what's there. When we think about the teachings of the Buddha, the discourses of the awakened ones, all of these are methods to bring this familiarity closer uh, to home, so to speak. If we couple this then with the methods of the accumulation of merit, purification of previously engaged misdeeds, which are all possible because there is no independent uh, kind of misdeed that can't be purified. There is no inde uh, independent kind of, uh, kind of merit, the one that will ultimately, because of its independent, lie outside of one's reach. It is because the actions that we've engaged and the results thereof are mutually dependent, because they are void or empty of autonomous existence, that that we can accumulate merit and uh, purify ourselves of previously engaged misdeeds. But this is only possible if the activity is held within uh, what we call bodhicitta in both its ultimate and relative uh, aspects. And based uh, thereupon, we are able to engage these activities with this uh, understanding. Then we are able to kind of exhaust in the, on a gross level, in the moment almost, our adherence to uh, or hankering after true or independent uh, existence. But on a more subtle level, when we think about uh, cause and effect, the karmic law, uh, if you will, to really understand this on its most subtle level, 
one needs to understand that the mutual dependence between subject and object is kind of a duality. And on that level, if we are able to overturn this very subtle kind of a kind of mm, kind of hankering after an independent, uh, uh, sorry, projection of an independent object that is able to be overturned within ourselves, then that experience is called liberation, or that is called freedom, if you will. Freedom from what? The projection of and subsequent reification of this subtle uh, kind of duality. And it is this then that is over, uh, we are only able to overturn with wisdom. Here the wisdom then is of uh, mutual, uh, mutual dependence. And indeed, when we think about kind of being in a position, wishing to change that position, through understanding a mutual dependence, in a way, in the world where we find ourselves, if we would like to secure a particular position or to hold a particular uh, position in the world, we understand that perhaps we are not experiencing it uh, at the moment, or perhaps we're not having it the way we would like at the moment, but it is not impossible to achieve that if we kind of work at gathering the respective kind of causes and conditions. So in a way, we, sim we understand mutual dependence and work with that on a, on, in, a secular le in a secular way. However, this uh, reflection is somewhat limited by our uh, particular uh, view of the world and with our uh, with regard to the particular with regard to the peculiarity of what we would like to uh, experience. But understanding mutual dependence with regard to every single thing in our lives, this will allow us to overcome grasping on in this both kind of gross and subtle. Uh, le ways or levels. Similarly, it will allow us to overcome hostility, etc., on both these kind of gross and subtle uh, levels. So here, the idea of kind of going beyond this adherence to uh, duality, to go beyond that, or to definitely emerge from under the boot, so to speak, of that attitude is some kind of attitude of renunciation, which is of course necessary, but in and of itself, it is. It needs to be kind of enhanced, enhanced with a great compassion. And mutual dependence, interdependence, if you like, allows this uh, to happen. Accordingly, then, when we are practicing and we experience uh, useful things, good things, etc., we should understand that it is these things, good experiences that we have, subjective uh, happiness, if you like, in the moment, this is only possible because of dependent arising. And it's exactly the same or its opposite. But nevertheless, when we experience things, when they appear to us, it is our tendency to grasp upon them as existing independently over there. And we act upon that. In other words, we are kind of deceiving ourselves. And through this kind of self-deception, which is the greatest kind of self-deception uh, in the sense that we feel that through projecting uh, autonomy on an object, an object that we then project a sense of, I like that upon, and act there under the influence of, then we, we kind of bring about, or we kind of um, propagate our own kind of uh, experience of contaminated uh, existence. So accordingly, once again, in order to rid ourselves of this kind of duality or the understanding thereof, the only thing that we can engage is a realization of uh, a wisdom, rather, that realizes selflessness. So selflessness here, then, we can also translate as without independence, without inherent existence, without autonomy, etc. When we reflect upon purification, when we think about this kind of activities or changing a particular experience in life, this is possible because nothing exists in terms of objects or the subjective experience uh, thereof independently. And so when we talk of, kind of perfecting ourselves and bringing about this attitude of uh, bodhicitta in both its ultimate and relative aspects, if we deal with, for example, the relative, we can reflect upon uh, how each and every sentient being has had the experience of being a, a parent to one, recalling the kindness, repaying the kindness, and so forth. The six causes, one leading to the effect of the relative bodhicitta, understanding its nature as mutually dependent. Thereby, we understand then uh, the ultimate uh, bodhicitta. Indeed, when it comes to anything, when we reflect upon bodhicitta, 
yes, it reflects in the ultimate aspect too. Um, in the ultimate aspect, bodhicitta then uh, refers to uh, the interdependent nature of things, the empty nature of things. But on the relative level, it refers to engaging uh, with the world in an, in a way that is held by our understanding of mutual dependence. So accordingly, we rely upon other sentient beings to bring about bodhicitta, and it is through the influence of that reliance that we're able to progress to the stages of complete and perfect uh, awakening. Indeed, if we kind of kid ourselves that we like to be alone, well, everything that we do is a product of some uh, is a product of something else. Everything that we possess was wrought by others. So, if we think I'm alone, I'm completely alone, we're just kidding ourselves, in the sense that we, wherever we are, whatever we are doing, whatever we possess, wherever we are going, etc., we are continually relying upon others, others who are less fortunate in the sense that they are still under the influence of this a destructive attitude of projecting autonomy onto that which has never had any truly existent entity, and are perpetuating thereby their own experience of samsara or dukkha. And this is a, a sign of a great a great shame, something that is uh, deeply kind of disturbing. So accordingly, it is imperative to reflect upon others, in terms of relative, and then the nature, or the mutually dependent nature of the mind that aspires to awakening for the benefit of others. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. うん、ちゃんじゅうぎ、せんだ。なんだとにぎにちんがに。え、たすさまいちんちんごより、いいなやんだ。まず、てかにてりんがぞ、わんぎにちかにやん。まちんば、かしゆなぎ、え、じしじ
Digi ngo de la rangjin kwaran ane tombe chane de la tenda ba sere. Tenda ba kunzo bini pa tu yue me doa. De nga to rang da rang re. Nang se mi de nan de. Che yu ke de nan de. Yu yu jen kare de ki de nan de. Kunzo tan kato ro da tenda ba ni de. Ani zungres de yu da. Zungres. De yin za ne. Sanji jom den de yi. Chu yi ya ka sung yu ni de nan la. Ta do ngai che bar ji sung. Ta do ngai che bar nan ni ya. Ta che ju de ta kwa yi ni men che bar ji si ho doa. Ta ngai chu nan ni na. Ta ya ngai ju de ho ma. Ani cha ju 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 ni ju ju. Nen ju la na me be ju se. Sem kam da me be ni tu ngai ni. Ani kale kale la. Ani bang cha bang drup cha drup ni. Cha jin zi ju nan doa. Ma tu nyo mong ra wa sang wa yin za. Yin na yang. Ani. Kora. Zhe den ba ni. Lam tap shi ni. Ani. Zhe bu gu ni. Zhe la ya zi. Ande. Ka pa ma lo wa zi. Zhe den ba ni. Lam tap shi ni de. Gu ni de. Yin da zi ni yong yang me wa zi. Zhe den ba ni ka la. Han gu ni. Ten dam den ba gun zop den ba ka la. Do yi gab zi. Ngo su su. Tung gu men do ma do. Ngosu yoyo ara, shuki sungo yoyo ara. Kaya zi zuk tongba, tongba ni zuk so, tongba ni le zuk jen ma yino. Zuk le tongba ni jen ma yino, sung doa. O, ta dendi ji che ju mongbo zi, kun zup denba ta, tandam denba di, haya wu zi kona. O, ya, tanda nga, shari duche ji pungbo di ye, bang lang getu, dikpung getu, gatu yi nyumba chepa chiba yi na yang nyumba di chung jore doa. Te sung zang, nga, Kham deshi ni bhe no ni nga so yi tham yong so zo ba nga so re nga so nga so chul re ji xia ri duxi ji pung bo ji ma yi hang tu yur de ya de nga yi yin che ni ding dik se ni zi de ya de nga so nga so nga so nga nai ma nara gare ji zun zhong ma kha wa yu re nga so yi kham deshi ni bo ji ta zi ji zun zhong ma yu ma re o ya de nang jin jian bai yang de nang jin jian ren zi de nang jin jia wa tu ji chang ani eh san jin jom den de Sanji jom den de yi go yi go ba la so ba long yi go ba nang ba rong ba chu yi go ba nang ba rong ba den de za chim bu za chim ba de eni nang tu ya de kandre si chung wa de oh ya di kong ge eni sang je sung nang doa sang la li de na eni lo ba ra ji nyo mong tu sum de 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 sang ge la li de na la kham de shi nyo bu ji eni so yong su zok ba de ngon ngon du ya jel ni di sar tu je ya ge jamar ba Nga zo, oh, ta di pe misi, pe misi ye nenga za chimbo re wo, pe misi nenga za chimbo. De sung zang, nga zo, wang yusa yi na, nga yi yu yu si tiyan di, ka liu ka gori, ta zo di, tong ni tok ba yi lo zi yu na. Nga zo, ong sun ba ba shi, tong ba ni du jul lo di, tong ni go la sang na zi ko bo ro wa. Ye so su zo ni, so su ji bo, zi sam da wa yi na, ta go ma yi na, ka liu ka go. Ani wang shu ba yi na, wang shu ni la di ka ni zi wo re, go yi un bi li ni ma chung. Ya, cakcik tuan sana ya juli ni macam, ane pat cik tim dua ni kerja mari, dendi tu ye, rara roro sesam tawa ina, macam orang nong tu memang dulu ane jutu memang dua, tesung zang, ane ngaco je, cuit tam je cuma tawa ini mati, dendi ini tu ane cik dah dah, oh si ngaco mewah ini memang dua, zuk tong bau, zuk tong bau, tong bau, si zuk tong bau, tinju ane, cewa tewa tewa tawa ini tu ane tong bau, tong bau. Tong ba o lao shi lao shi yue ba te ta chue ba re da. Yue dang teo nyi di ta thak ba da ma ta wa nyingi ya teo nyi di ta tong ba nyi teo nyi ta zi su teo ngu re da. Ha le ba re tong ba nyi yi zan ni yue re tong ba nyi yi zan sang jie ju yue re tong ba nyi yi zan ni nye wa da yi ta ta turu ta yue re dikwa zan di jie do dikwa sa zo ye di kwa ra sa ji jie da yu da yu jien chong ma zi ten jong yi nam sha zi do a ten jong yi nam sha di yi ten ni O, ta nga tsu zang e shi o zi jiu gi do a. Te sung zang, ta, a, le tang bo wa da. Ani ji, nga tsu di do a, chue da wa yi na. Ta ji, a, le tang bo da, ji, mang bo zi sung a di, pak cha yue me ke che leo ro a. Pak cha yue me ni sung a ni sung nang do a. Ta te zang, nga tsu, kang dar, tang ma lo a, ya ko, zi, Shi mi to ne, wang yu sa yu yu, kam de shi nyimbu ni tu yunga ne, de ni, di ka ni ya, rang ha jie, la li di ka ni ya, jie 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 wa. 
Deni takpa ramjan ji jing takpa yongsu zogwa takpa ramjan ji eni jingam yongsu zogwa ji sanji da chanju senba yongsu zogwa ji chenba lana meba da nimba lana meba da zewa lana meba ni ju de ani chik ma chinchi lapsu yewa chik kora ju tun bengani meto je gidwa ju tun bengani ngato jibu yongsu do de nang ji ju tun bengani eni ngato ani mata bi lyu de takpa komcho ya komcho yewa Ani mata bi sim de ani takwa komju yoba takwa sene nyumo meba ani eh khatoro goda eh da rang nyumo mena tonge yo marwa de rang tonge meba mate je tonge meba zo tumye ji nyumba de demba ani khatoro goda chemba lana meba har si chere kundo chenang yu tam ji tonga ni juma da ore chemba lana meba Chimba lama meba di di chen so waina ani so du ye gajin teje teba da ichi la ya di kanu sin je wore nga tu gajin se de ta ha ta mi ji lu ji si ke chama ro mi ji ki ta ta nga zo la ani ji lam lu su ke chama ro nga tu gajin nyu mu za ni meba ji cha jin zo la nga zo le ga um ngui ni su chu ni ye be de ngui ni su chu ni she ba di ji kan la Chuchin yishe zik zha chen bo zik chen song wa yina ha le ba re ba. Jie zang do yi ni zhi ni ngai yi gab la le lu zhen na ngai yi ya ngai la mi ju de wong ma. Di ni ta du ngai la mi ngai la mi na ni ya ta ka zho ro la na mi ni zhi ngai ni ya. Di ni ji ngai zho liu sa gu gom ka le ka le ma hong ba la ani di ni ji yi tam yi la yi ngol la jie tup ya. Ani ngai ka zho ro da zung. Ani kato ro da takwa kom nga nga yi ta. Ani ma hong ba la ni sung sa yang dobya nga kwa me ba. Ta tu ani sim de yang ani ji kato ro tong ba yu, sel ba yu, nyin ba da yu ba, chen ba yu ba, zai ba yu ba, nyin ba da yu ba. Den di zi ki kale ka kom ju yu ba zi ta sa nga yi no ni dun go shi. Te sung za ta di zi yi ki ni zi yi nga ni eni chin che lap si la li so su zi ki ya ya gom. Te ni nga yi nyin ba. Ani sa nga yi chue di kare re se na che ji lyu ji la sa nji ji ya la yu me de. Ani ta ji sa nga yi chue di re ma do kale ka wure sung ya de. Nga gom nga chang la gom la ya de. Kare ji ni yung gure nga de. La di kare ji ni yung gure se na. To ni ni nji zung nang zi yi ngo la ta gom ba ji gu gure. Ani nga so xie dang jie me dong ni ni jie zong nang jie me wai na Ni ni ta ra go yon jio ta shou fa yon jio Ani jie ani ke wu ta ya yu miam jio zoro zi jie Ching jio si tia zoro zi jie Ani nga so tepa hane si jie yi chiu zo Ae gong lok ta jie yi doa Di yong ma di di ni zi kia xia ma ra wa Di so xie da cha ma ra wa Chue tam jie dong ni na dien na pa Dong ni dien na pa ma zi Se mi rang jie dong ni zang ma yin ba Di yi sel cha na ni Be se ba zo ye di kun zop di ni zong an Tuan dam kun zop di ta chim ba Tony Tobi Zonga Sasha Zinu. Tony Lady Chuni Mon. Zonga Sasha Lady Kunzo and Tapa Chat. Ta? Ta da nga to matawa. Matu y shadi di jipungo. Sato riba chasun. Tapa shalu de nala? Deni? Zawa meba. Ani shingam mama devaran. Korwa devaran. Zingam je mado. Deni loks of no turgurimazo. Deni redoa. Pem misi tachi mo deni redoa. Te sung zan. Ta? One tane. Katsoro. Wong Jusa ji Chawa di Susu Ta Tony Dobi ji Tunda di te Zi shi wa yina Deni Wong Jusi La Gom ji Deni la yina Tony Dobi Zung na la Shia li te na la Chien ba la na me ba Nin ba la na me ba Zawa la na me ba Ni nga ni Deni chue la Chukur di ba na ji se ne Sa chien bu di Shia yung ni de la De la Deni Yi che da Me ba da Zawa da Pe me si Sa chien bu di le ng ro Ta de Tang bo ma le la Malay wa yi nang kar chen chi gore. Te ni lama di ngore. Ani, ke kar zoro ta. Te chang man lo wa ni. Lame, susu ki ki kewe shi ni zi ma te na susu dro shi maare. Jumze de di ring ane le yung gore. Ni jie, lama di ngore zone, lama zah chen bu chi gore. Si te kyo maare. Top down meba si kyo maare. Si jie zo top down ranyam da chi chi yin se la di. Di chi di ngore kya cha maare. Mune. Lana meba, lama soya di, lana meba di, la, kese shi, lana meba la ya di, chanju ki sem dang, to ni tawa zi, susu rang la, ane wane chani, chung na, 
我是结果的,马上来呢,这样就是这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,这样的,
I'm going to meditate on a deity. Where does the deity appear from? Yes, it has a color and a shape, etc. But it's not something that exists outside of our experience over there, uh, so to speak. So when we say, I'm going to appear as a deity, this is not something coming from outside. Rather, it is a means of bringing to mind or recalling the innate nature of awareness, Buddha nature itself. In the moment, having brought this uh, to the forefront of one exp one's experience, then one utilizes this, one grasps a hold of this, if you will. One becomes this, if you prefer, and then utilizes this pure nature as, a, as the path. Now, of course, the mind, as you know, indeed, the entire makeup of the subtle body is, is innately kind of empty. It is free from any notion of, uh, of autonomy uh, uh, whatsoever. This uh, is simply then the nature, uh, the nature of the kind of subtle body, if you like, but most important, mind. When we talk of the innately pure nature of the mind, this then refers to mind itself being, uh, in a way, responsible for the way we perceive the world. So we can talk of the indivisibility of the subject and the, uh, and the object. Indivisibility in the sense of one relying upon the other, or in union, if you will. Now here, this needs to be kind of understood in its kind of ultimate nature, in its ultimately pure uh, kind of nature, if you will. And the way of revealing the pure nature of the mind, if we think of then the pure nature of the mind, the innately empty nature of natural luminosity, which is uh, kind of in terms of ultimate and relative, which is the relative, that which appears, if you will, this natural awareness or luminosity itself is innately pure because it is innately empty. As it is innately empty, then, as, you, as we know, anything is, uh, anything is possible. So with regard to the teachings of uh, Vajrayana, the Vajrayana teachings then are, can be, broadly speaking, divided into outer and inner. Within the outer, then we can talk of action, performance, and yoga, and within it, then we can talk of um, various divisions. But primarily, when we talk of inner tantra, this refers to the highest uh, tantra. And these methods differ in that the way of introducing the innate purity of the mind is, in case of outer tantra, is a little bit kind of on the more obvious level, the gross level, if you like. And this becomes, through uh, the various divisions of tantra, increasingly more subtle. And when we talk of highest, highest here then refers to the innate uh, luminosity that is brought to the fore through those particular methods. Accordingly, we can divide the, the, the path then in a way to the basal ground of the two truths, ultimate and relative. So ultimate and relative, ultimate refers to the mutually dependent or empty nature of things, and the relative and the ultimate expression to the innate uh, luminosity or, or, or natural awareness, if you will, of mind itself, part of the, of the which as we've gone through, of the four truths and the resultant the twofold kaya of, of the way things are and the way things appear, the dharma and uh, dhammakaya and samogakaya, uh, respectively. Now, when it comes to the sutrayana, the notion of the two truths is introduced. Where is it introduced? So, in, the, in its most obvious uh, aspect, in the Heart Sutra, when we say form is empty, emptiness is form, form is none other than emptiness, emptiness is none other than form. Here we are introduced then to the appearing form and its nature, its interdependent nature, its empty nature. And the two of these then are introduced separately, but there is also then the hint of their interdependence. For example, form is none other than emptiness, emptiness is none other than form. So there is this mutual dependence. But what happens here is when we understand uh, then the, the nature of the appearing object, whatever that may be, whatever that form uh, takes, and uh, its nature, when the object uh, appears to us, we hang, we kind of project, rather than looking at its nature, which is empty, we rather project a sense of, uh, we might say, fullness. Fullness in the sense of uh, independent self-entity. And then that is adhered to. And then 
you know, this grasping comes in, in into play. We grasp at an object as kind of being other than its nature. If we reflect on the empty nature of awareness and the empty nature of the object, they are both the same. So when the object appears within our mind, there is this projection of it being something other than uh, mind. This then, be thus then, begins the process of, of uh, distorting reality. The reality then, as something appears from within awareness itself, as it is appearing within awareness itself, awareness itself being primordially pure, whatever appears within that is of the same nature, which is empty. But then there is the projection that this, what has appeared, is other than the awareness from whence it arose, and it exists over there as something independent. And this then is the cause. The adherence thereto is then the cause of all of our woes. The hankering after that experience, that is to say, the grasping onto that experience, is then which causes us to then migrate throughout the various um, realms of, uh, of, of cyclic existence. So when we reflect upon the practice of taking the resultant state of the path, within the empty nature of awareness itself, rather than hankering after ordinary appearance, the way things appear to us usually, if we reflect on their empty nature, we then bring to the fore the Buddha nature, its pure awareness in and of itself. And it's that awareness and emptiness that appears in the form of the, of the deity. And then we engage in the particular activities. So, for example, when we think of appearing in the form of Tara, Majishri, Avalokiteshvara, uh, the great Vajra holder, whatever, this particular appearance is not other than our experience. It's not something over there, so to speak. We think of the et etymology of Buddha. So if we look at the Tibetan Sang and Ge, are the two parts that make up that particular phrase, the meaning of which is to be completely uh, awake, or the awakened one. Awakened one. So, awake, what does this mean? Here, sang has a dual connotation of waking and also of purifying. What, is we, what are we awakened from or what are we uh, purified? Is this disturbing emotions or disturbing states of mind that arise from this fundamental distortion of reality. So, the, the, reality, the, the uh, reality is no longer distorted. It is recognized in uh, and of itself and thereby there is no more there are no more disturbing states of mind and actions engaged under their influence so this is what has been woken up from this is what is uh, purified and that the experiencer the one who is awake if you like or then the kind of the one that is experienced said purification uh, then is awareness itself so here we talk of the awakened nature being none other than the our the the awakened a Buddha rather than being none other than our awakened uh, emptiness. So here, it is essentially the emptiness of the mind that appears uh, as the deity. When we appear as a deity, then what we're actually doing is seeing through the kind of illusory nature of things. There's no longer something over there that we can get kind of uh, upset about, but everything is seen to be rather an illusion. Here, when we think about things appearing as an illusion within this uh, fundamental, uh, fundamental within the pure, uh, within the experience <laughs> of the fundamentally pure nature uh, of mind, etc., within the understanding of this empty kind of uh, awareness, then everything can appear purely. That's pure. That's possible because this is simply the nature of things. However, again, going back to this misunderstanding of the fundamentally pure nature of things, misunderstanding of the innate uh, Buddha nature, if you will, or the awakened, awakened nature, if you prefer. The misunderstanding thereof leads to a distortion. Acting under the influence of said distortion of reality, thereafter come disturbing emotions. With these emotions comes action, and those actions bring reactions, or effects, if you like, cause and effect. And so the you know, six realms of samsara, whatever they may be, whether it be from the lowest kind of health experience to the hungry ghost, 
human is relatively straightforward and as, as is animal, titan and, and uh, divinity. All of these then appear out of this fundamental uh, confusion. But it's apparent also, it's, in, it's important also uh, to reflect that this distortion is adventitious. It's not an in inherent autonomous part of who we are. And accordingly, it can be removed. The reason we propagate it is because of habit. We're just used to it. And we've just kind of become, in a way, inert, such that, oh, this is simply the way of things. But here, at this moment, what we are doing within this particular practice is to seize that in the moment and utilize the method of, of deity yoga merging with the deity so as to draw out the innate uh, Buddha nature to meditate on what we can call the all-pervasive um, purity uh, of things. Everything is uh, innately pure because everything is ultimately simply the misunderstanding of this innately pure nature. And it is simply a case of addressing uh, this misunderstanding in the moment and allowing the innate Buddha, uh, the innate Buddha nature to manifest in the moment. So the utilization of appearing as a pure deity within the pure realm, engaging in pure activities and so forth. These are all means or methods to simply become familiar with what is already uh, there. This is what is meant then by taking the result uh, as the path. And this method or means is one within which, as I mentioned, we are bringing the result to the fore. Having brought the result to the fore, what happens thereby is our hankering after ordinary appearance, which we're already familiar with, because I've been mentioning it so much, this kind of perfect, this kind of projection of autonomy and subsequent adherence thereto, reificating it and acting under its influence, becomes exhausted as the power of becoming familiar with simply the nature of things, pure appearance, takes takes over. And so this is an extremely profound. Uh, path to utilize this innate purity as a means or as a, a way to draw out the innate Buddha nature uh, within us. Because the understanding of this uh, nature is, is simply that. Wisdom is simply understanding the true nature of things. It's nothing uh, any more outrageous uh, than that. So the practice of you know, Vajrayana or Mantrayana, if you will, is something truly amazing because in the moment it allows us to awaken. It gives us the means to exhaust samsara in its entirety, in the moment. So through the practice we talk of you know, the fourfold purity as I mentioned earlier, meditating on oneself as a, as a deity. So we always have the idea of subject and object, right? So the subject is oneself as a, as a deity. In the moment, we meditate upon ourselves in a particular pure form and independence thereupon. When we actualize it, in reality, we will, we will awaken in the aspect of whatever we are meditating upon, uh, whatever aspect of Buddha we are meditating upon ourselves in uh, right now. Similarly, when it comes to mantra repetition, the benefit of mantra uh, repetition is to draw out the innate purity of, of speech such that one will actualize the resultant state, the speech of the Buddha, which is um, <clears throat> unconfounded, and uh, in a way, it's uh, without kind of a stopping, unimpeded. And similarly, with the mind, what we are meditating upon now is in the natural luminosity, natural uh, awareness itself. And this, then, of course, is meditate is or abided within or meditated upon in its nature. In other words, in the emptiness of luminosity and uh, emptiness as the mind. And of course, this exhausts any kind of grasping or hankering after ordinary appearance or any projection of autonomy uh, thereupon. So this, when we talk of the blessing, this is the kind of fundamental blessing of drawing out the Buddha uh, in uh, the moment. And what makes this possible is, as I mentioned, in its ultimate aspect, deity and all of these practices, these pure practices, arise or are possible in the ultimate way because of 
the union of emptiness and compassion conjoined. Without that, these don't really work. You can't really meditate on the empty nature of uh, one's mind whilst grasping after the true nature of uh, the deity, etc. So when we talk of appearance and emptiness, ultimately appearance is awareness, natural uh, awareness, sometimes known as innate luminosity, which is naturally present but obscured by our grasping after or hankering after or addiction, if you will, to ordinary uh, appearance. Now when we think of all the other methods within uh, the Vajrayana, such as a deity having a particular color, a particular form, a particular attribute or aspect, uh, etc., being a, a singular deity in union or whatever, this is all symbolic. What it's symbolic of are the qualities of this basal or foundational or awareness and its uh, nature. And it is this which is drawn out through uh, the particular method or the, the means to actualize it, which can have uh, various, uh, various, uh, various forms. Various forms, that is to say, meditational scenarios, or methods or means, if you will. And these are practices which reveal the innate nature of everything that we experience in the moment. So, for example, when we think of samsara and nirvana, if you will, samsara being the maya within which we find ourselves, which causes us so much dissatisfaction and difficulty, nirvana being then the actualization of the resultant state of pure awareness. These are just the same thing viewed differently. It's not that one kind of steps out of uh, samsara into uh, a new set of clothing that is nirvana. Nothing like that. Here, one simply recognizes the nature uh, for what it is, the innately pure nature uh, of things. And this is not something that is obvious, not at all. It needs to be introduced, and for this reason, it is imperative to rely upon a spiritual teacher, a spiritual friend, if you like. And generally, we use the term um, guru or lama. So when we look at the word uh, guru means somebody who is heavy uh, with qualities. Uh, if you look at the Tibetan translation of Lama, means somebody who has the highest quality. But the quality needs to be known as the, uh, this understanding of emptiness, of the innate purity, the nature of things, of bodhicitta in both its relative and ultimate aspects, in both its gross and subtle presentations and means of application, whether they be causal or resultant. And it is for this reason that we say that uh, the Lama or the spiritual teacher is extremely precious. Why? Because they embody the, the experience of the resultant state and they are able, through their kindness, to introduce this to us such that we can recognize the innately pure nature of things, such that we can wake up, uh, but in particular with regard to the resultant uh, Vajra, Vajra vehicle, we can wake up relatively quickly that is to say, at best, in one short lifetime. Lasso. Lasso,